Our theme for the year is In Christ Alone, and the month of October we're exploring how we spend our time, and today we're going to be looking specifically at how we spend our time at work. Not just about how much time we spend uh, specifically doing our work, you know, finding that balance between work and all the other aspects of our lives, but also about how well we spend our time at work from God's perspective. When you're a young person, your job, your work, is school. Uh, Your occupation is student. And everything we talk about today regarding our work applies directly to you in the context of school. Yeah, it didn't go over so well. (laughs) It's okay, it's not going to go over very well for them either. So, Uh, There are so many great resources available to help us understand God's perspective on our time at work. Andy Stanley has a series called Taking Care of Business, which I drew on heavily for this lesson. Um, It's available on Right Now Media, and I highly recommend it, as well as a series on Colossians from Louis Giglio. If you hear me say anything interesting or insightful today, it's a quote from one of those guys. <laughs> when you're driving to work, it's fun to look at bumper stickers, and you know, especially the ones that are about work, right? And I found that you can put them into categories. For example, there are the ones uh, in the I need more money category. There's the classic, I owe, I owe, so off to work I go. And the more modern version of that, despite all my rage, I'm still making minimum wage. (laughs) Then the more realistic view, I pretend to work, they pretend to pay me. And one of the all-time greats, filthy, stinking rich, two out of three ain't bad. (laughs) Then there's the I'm lazy category. Hard work never killed anyone, but why take the chance? And I wish I had a job I could quit. I don't even really know what that one means. (laughs) And this awesome one, work, it's not just for sleeping anymore. And then the last category, the I'm miserable ones. It's been a long week already, and it's only Monday. Then this truly desperate plea for vacation. I used up all my sick days, so I called in dead. (laughs) Of course, the classic, I'm in no hurry, I'm on my way to work. And the more modern version, I'm on my way to work, please kill me. That guy needs a new job. (laughs) Actually, what that guy really needs is a new perspective on work. And that's what we're going to spend our time on this morning. So open your Bibles to Colossians 3. I'm not going to put it on the screen. I'm not even going to tell you what page it's on. (laughs) Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. You can get there. Uh, Who remembers what we're supposed to be fasting on today in our 40 40 days of prayer and fasting? Don't check your phone when you're together with other people. So if you're sitting next to someone who uses a Bible app on their phone or tablet, go ahead and lean over right now and take a look at that screen. (laughs) Make sure it says Colossians 3 on there somewhere, all right? I, I know you people. All right, Colossians 3. Our scripture reading this morning was verses 22 through 24. Thank you very much for that. Appreciate that. Uh, about servants and masters and working as unto the Lord. And it comes on the heels of a very important context. So let's start back in verse 1. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears then you also will appear with him in glory. Who here has been baptized into Christ's death and raised to walk in newness of life? Okay, then this is talking to you. And he says, if you've been raised with Christ, what? Seek the things that are above. What does that mean? It means pursue godly things, a way of thinking and acting that matches the way they think and act in heaven. Uh, a way of living and a character that spans beyond this life and carries over seamlessly into the next one. Set your mind. Make your decisions based on what's important to God, not on what seems like it'll get you the most satisfaction from your life on earth. That's all going away anyway. It's impossible to miss in verses 3 and 4 that the God who made you and loved you and saved you wants to be with you. It's equally clear, starting in verse 5, that he wants you to be changed to be like him. 
Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these two you once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Why do we have to stop doing all those bad things? Because they belong to your old self, and they're not compatible with your new self, which is in the image of God. So what does the new self look like? Verse 12, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Colossians 3 is a call to behave a certain way, to live life a certain way because of who we have become because of who we have been changed into. And just in case all that wasn't clear enough, the rest of the chapter is details about the attitudes and behaviors of the new self in the context of our relationships at church, in marriage, in family, and at work. When you become someone who has put out of your life sexual immorality and coveting and anger and slander and obscene talk and lying, and instead you are compassionate and kind and humble and patient, and you bear with people, and you forgive them the way Christ does, and you have his love and his peace in your heart ruling there, what does that translate to in the way you do your work or in the way you relate to your coworkers and your boss? It translates... To verses 22 through 24. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. So let's dig in now and make sure we understand how to use our time at work to be the new self that God is forming us into. To start with, let's zoom in on verse 23. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Most everyone here already knows this. One of the first responsibilities God gave man was to work. Work is not the result of sin. Uh, In the perfect world, God assigned responsibility to man. Genesis 2.15 says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. There was Adam, made in God's image, in the middle of the most beautiful place on earth that God had made just for him. And what was he doing? He was working. And God was pleased with everything. God loves it when we work. Proverbs has a ton of verses that warn us about being lazy. Romans 12, 11 says, Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. It's really important to God that you don't be this guy. Okay, that's it. That's it. Cannot take that anymore. <clears throat> know anyone at work like that? <laughs> that clearly does not match up with God's desire for us to work with all your heart. Unless you are literally a sloth, God expects you to put a lot more energy into your work. 
Furthermore, what's important to God about our work is generally not the same as what's important to us. We're concerned about things like where we work, how much we make, our title, how significant our work is to society. I got to tell you, God's really not concerned much about those things. What he's really interested in is our attitude and our effort. The way we evaluate the significance of what we do is entirely different than the way God does. We look at the task itself. God looks at the condition of our heart while we're doing the task. How do we know this? Look at the first three words of verse 23. Whatever you do. See, you can't wait till you get your dream job to work at it with all your heart. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. You may be thinking, why in the world would anyone put their heart into what I do? All I do is put two all-beef patties on a sesame seed bun and throw it out the drive through window. Or all I do is cook dinner for people who don't even like it and wash clothes for people who can't even get it in the hamper. Or all I do is prepare taxes and insurance for people who lie to me about their finances. Or I'm a doctor and an, or a nurse trying to take care of people who won't even take care of themselves. And eventually, I'm going to move on or retire or die and someone else is going to step in and fill my spot like I was never even there. Where's the significance in that? What's the value in that? Why should I put my heart into that. Those are the kind of thoughts you have when underneath it all, you're really working unto men. Or you've been reading the first part of Ecclesiastes, <laughs> one or the other. You know what it works, uh, looks like to work unto men, right? You do as little as possible to get by. You take credit for everything you can. You look busy even when you're not. Carry the folder, walk fast. You leave the spreadsheet open up on your screen so when you're not there, it looks like you're working. I got you on that one, huh? Okay. But when you realize your true boss is the Lord, it looks a lot different. You get to work on time. You put in a full day's work. You do quality work. You keep your promises and you honor your commitments. You put others first and you whistle while you work. The new self you're being changed into is someone who likes to work and takes pride in doing a good job at whatever you do, because you know it makes God proud of you. You're like, hey God, check out this hamburger I made. And he's like, oh yeah, check out that cow I made. Yeah, but good job on the hamburger. <laughs> <clears throat> I want to show you something. That is a stack of kitchen towels. Guess who folded those towels? You're looking at him. See, whatever you do, do it with all your heart. And by the way, that's how they always look. I did not just do that for that picture. I know what you're thinking, you wicked people. Okay, so there are two key points that I want to tell you. Then I'm going to show you a short video. First key point, how you perform at work is as important as how you behave at work. Displaying Christian values and morals is great. It's just as important to not be a slacker. Point number two, putting your heart into your work allows God to bless your work. In marriage, when you handle your marriage according to God's rules for, and God's plan for marriage, you enable God to bless your marriage because God doesn't bless sinfulness. In finances, when you start handling your money the way God tells us to in his word, you open the door for God to bless your finances. Same principle for work. Maybe you hate your job. Maybe you're praying every day, oh, Lord, please get me out of here. Just let me get that other job, then I'll work with all my heart. I'll do my best. Bless me by moving me out of here. But God says, I can bless you now. But I can't bless you until you, let, uh, until you handle that area of your life the way I've told you to. If you'd like me to bless your work, I need you to invite me in. And when you invite me in, I'm going to say, do it with all your heart, as if you were doing it for me, whatever it is. In the Taking Care of Business series, Andy Stanley tells an amazing true story, and I'm just going to play it for you. I can't do it as good as him. Well, last story. Um, about a year and a half ago, Sandra and I moved out just north of Crabapple. We built a house. 
and one of my best friends um, built our house for us and, and he's still our best friend. So that tells you something about his work ethic. Anyway, um, built our house and something happened I wanna tell you about and then I'll close. He was out pouring our driveway and he was out there with his crew and you know, they got the truck and they're just scraping and you know, doing the whole deal. And um, this, all of a sudden he heard this and he said he was kind of in a bad mood and kind of cranky and just, you know, the, in the building industry, it's just a difficult industry to work in, lots of variables and people issues. So he's out there kind of mentally there and watching these guys. And all of a sudden he hears this loud music and down the street to the cul-de-sac um, comes the Porta John guy. Now that's not the official title, but the Porta John guy shows up at work sites and cleans the Porta Johns. Now, if you've ever been around a Porta John when it was being cleaned, it is about the most unpleasant thing other than being in one while it's being cleaned. But anyway, it's awful. So he says, he looks up, here comes the Porta John guy, and there's the Porta John right there. I mean, they're moving up the driveway. They are right beside it. And he said, the whole crew kind of went, uh, because they've got to work right there and they're about to get, you know, anyway. So he says, this guy gets out of the truck. And the first thing he notices, it's not the guy that normally cleans the Porta John's, it's some new guy. And he looked at him, he's a big old guy with tattoos and kind of scruffy and gets all his equipment, his big old hose and marches up the yard and, you know, and goes in there. He says, so they're out there kind of just waiting for it to happen, you know, and they, they anyway, I'll go into all that. And all of a sudden, the first thing he noticed, he said, the guy is in there forever. He says, you know, how long does it take to clean it? You know, two and a half by two and a half. He says, he's got tools, they're bumping around in there. And it, it, he said, he just was in there forever, taking forever. And then all of a sudden he said, there was this incredible aroma that came out and just sort of went through the air over the whole work site. And they all kind of looked at each other and he said, it was just the most pleasant odor. And, and so that they were kind of shocked anyway, so they keep working. Well, the guy finally comes out and, and Bob said, I had to say something. He said, he said, man, you got that thing smelling so good. Kind of makes me want to go in there. <laughs> you know. Hmm. And the guy says to him, he says, you know what? He says, the guy that's been servicing you has been doing a terrible job, but I'm gonna take care of you. It's gonna be different from here on out. Bob said, well, well, thanks. And then the guy said, I work for the Lord. Bob said, you know, excuse me, he says, yeah, I do my work for the Lord. Picked up his tools, walked down the driveway, turned on his, what turned out to be loud blaring Christian music and drove on up the street. Now. Bob said, he said, I was so overwhelmed. He said, I had to just walk up the driveway and sit down on your front steps. And I looked up at this guy, he said, I had tears in my eyes. I thought, Lord, how in the world can I ever complain? And why in the world can I have that kind of attitude about what I do when here's a guy who granted, you know, he didn't stand at his high school graduation and say, one day I want to be. I mean, he's not where ultimately he saw himself wanting to be probably, right? I mean, if I were him, he's probably, he'd look for another better opportunity, a different job, but you know what? Whatever you do, whatever you do, wherever you have been assigned for this time to do it, you do your work as unto the Lord, not for men, because you have a reward and inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. And this guy, Got it. That's going to come up again later. So remember that story. Now that we've covered the middle, let's go back to the top of our section, Colossians 3.22. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers. A lot of versions say slaves instead of bond servants. That was the awful reality of their culture. We have awful things we're dealing with in our culture. This was one of theirs. So Paul starts off saying in verse 22, if you're a slave, be a really good slave. Later on in chapter 4, verse 1, he says, if you're a master, be a great master. And in the context of work, we're all kind of you know, somewhere in between those two points, right? You may feel like you're a slave. Your boss may treat you like you're a slave. Uh, but Louis Giglio observed this. He says, it may be that you work for a boss who's not the nicest boss in the world, but it doesn't necessarily require the circumstances changing, your boss or your job, for God to revolutionize you right in the middle of the circumstances. When Paul wrote to the Romans, he said in chapter 13, verse 1, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Whether it's in a government context 
or a corporate context, those authorities ultimately get their authority from God. Whether they know it or accept it or even believe in God, that's where it comes from. And as a Christian, that impacts the way we respond to them. As Paul says, we are to obey in everything. Now, just to state the obvious, he's not talking about moral or ethical issues or anything contrary to God's will or his laws. We're going to get to that next. Right now, we're just talking about things that, you know, at work are you know, bad ideas. Um, they, they cost more money. They make customers mad. Maybe they take the company in, a, in the wrong direction, in your opinion. So what are you supposed to do if you're a Christian and you work for someone who's not as smart as you are? <laughs> Have you ever said these words? If I was in charge, what's your natural response when the boss decides to do something that you think is just plain wrong? You may murmur and complain and send text messages and post stuff on Facebook. That's a really bad idea, by the way. Uh, Maybe you just ignore it and do whatever you want to do. Or maybe you do it, but you make sure it fails. Malicious compliance. And later on, you get to say, I told you so. None of those responses are really obeying the boss, though, are they? Sometimes it can be very, very difficult to submit to the boss. When you look at their decisions and you say, that's alienating the employees. That's going to blow the contract. That's ruining the company. We're all going to be out of work. It's not right. But remember the context when Paul wrote Romans 13. The Christians were living under a government that was overtly antagonistic toward them and their faith. They could have said, look at what the Roman rulers are doing. It's not right. And Paul says, obey them. He goes on in verse 2 to say, Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. When we resist authority, we're working against God. Have you noticed by now that God is almost always up to something that we're not aware of? How many examples of that do we see in the Bible? Pharaoh thought he was God. The Assyrians brutalized Israel. The Romans crucified Jesus. And God was working through them all. For some reason, it seems easier to us to believe uh, believe this about the ancient nations than it does about our boss. When the government's doing something that just makes you shake your head, remember who established it. When your boss is asking you to do something crazy, just remember who placed you under their authority. God says, they are a minister for my good, for your good. If I can handle Rome, I can handle your boss. God establishes and works through authorities. He does not bless rebellion. Now, that doesn't mean you just keep your mouth shut and never say anything. If you see the boss making a bad call, you owe it to them to say something. But after you've had your say, if the authority looks at you and says, this is the way it's going to be, then that's the way it's got to be. And you and I need to accept that and support it with a good attitude. See, there's more at stake than the success of the business and the benefit you derive from it. What's more important is if you are operating under the authority God has placed you under. Because when you submit to authority, you're submitting to our Father in heaven. And that is working as unto the Lord. So let's finish out verse 22. Paul says that when we work, we should work with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. So what about those cases where the boss or maybe the work culture tries to get you to do something that really is unethical or immoral? There can be so much pressure at work to shade the truth just a little or reduce the quality just a little or exaggerate the features just a little, claim a little more of the credit than is really true. Where does that pressure come from? Not that guy. It comes from from fearing or revering something other than the Lord. For example, job security. Sometimes we can feel that we have to perform at a certain level or be accepted by a certain person or group or risk losing our position. We fear for our job security unless we engage in the same unethical practices as everyone else, unless we change the wording just a little so that it's technically true but really leaves a wrong impression. 
because there's no other way to perform at their level. We fear something, but it's not the Lord. Or possibly we revere ourselves more than we revere the Lord. We feel like we can do a better job of advancing our career than he can. I mean, we don't consciously think that. You know, if someone asked us, we would deny it. But it must be hidden in our heart somewhere because that's the only explanation for our actions and decisions. We have a sneaking suspicion that he's not as concerned about our career as we are. Newsflash, <laughs> he's not. Our career isn't the big important thing to him that it is to us. And because we let our job be so important to us, we let ourselves give in to, to doing bad stuff to keep our job and to advance it. When you violate your conscience and do something unethical, you lose some things far more important than success at work. You lose your good reputation, your moral authority, your self-esteem, but by far the most important thing you lose is the opportunity of finding out what God would have done if you had stood your ground. What would have happened if I'd done the right thing? The Bible's full of stories where God showed up in amazing ways when a man or a woman stood their ground and said, no, I will not compromise. Want to see something amazing happen at your work? All you have to do is refuse to compromise your convictions on what God said is right or wrong. What's God going to do? I don't know, but I know what he's able to do. I have another question for you. Do you think you are where you are at work because of God's grace or because of your own efforts and self-discipline? If you're there by the grace of God, why would you violate the principles of God to try to maintain the blessings of God? Andy Stanley has a prayer that he says all the time with his family. I want to share it with you. Lord, give us the wisdom to know what's right and the courage to do what's right, even when it's hard. Can we say that prayer together as a family here? Can we just do that all together? Let's, let's say it together. Lord, give us the wisdom to know what's right and the courage to do what's right, even when it's hard. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, at the end of verse 24, Paul reminds us that when you are working, you are serving the Lord Christ. When you're at work, you have an obligation to do stuff, to get your work done, to fulfill your contract with your employer. You accomplish stuff, they pay you. <laughs> but frankly, that's just kind of a side thing because who are you really serving? The Lord Christ. And what does he want you to get done at work? Just like Ken told us this morning in his beautiful message at the Lord's table, one of the greatest mission fields is our place of work because other people get to see us respond in a godly way, hopefully, to all the same pressures and temptations that they're subject to. And not just the issues at work, as they get to know you, they get a glimpse into your life outside of work and they see something they know is different. Our job is to make sure they know why. That's always been one of the primary duties of God's people. In Isaiah 49, 6, God said to Israel, I will make you a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. And Jesus reminded them, the Israelites, in the Sermon on the Mount, that they were to let their light shine so that people would see their good works and do what? Glorify your Father in heaven. In other words, Jesus wanted the Romans and the Greeks and all the other nations to associate a Jewish person's good deeds with the Father in heaven. Remember all that stuff earlier about put off the old self and put on the new self? Well, here's the thing. It's not enough just to be a good person at work. I mean, then people might say, my, my, what a good person. <laughs> but we don't want people to say, what a good person. We want them to say, what a good God. We, want, we, we have to make them see that I'm a good person because I'm in a relationship with a good God and I want you to know that. So God says, you're a city on a hill, a lamp to be lifted up. But how do I be a light, really? Obviously, demonstrate good character. Uh, there's a guy named Trip Lee, <laughs> who is a rapper and pastor in Atlanta. <laughs> kind of wish we had one of those. <laughs> uh, anyway, he made a comment on the radio that was great, and I want to quote for you. <laughs> Uh, some of us have massive influence, some have mundane influence, some of us have great gifts, 
Some of us don't. Whatever your gifting or wiring, the size of your platform, we've been called to do the same thing. And we should not underestimate the power of being faithful to Jesus in public spaces. Other standard things we can do to be a light, you've heard these before. When someone's going through a tough time, offer a book or a video and you can say, you know, here's something that was really helpful to me. You can invite them to worship, to growth groups, to Camp Wamava. Um, you can, at, at work, start a morning Bible study, get a prayer group going, show some videos at lunch. This last one could be the hardest one because there are so many risks involved in it, seemingly. And that is praise God when something good happens to you at work. Have you ever secretly prayed for God to help you with something at work? You know, you don't want to mention it, say it. You're like, God, I got nothing. <laughs> if this thing's going to work, it's going to have to be from you. And in your heart, you know that somehow you've got to give him the glory, but you're not really sure how because you know he's going to come through and you've just got to figure out how to come through on your end. I suggest you pray. Ask God to give you an opportunity uh, to give him the glory for helping you with your work. And when it happens, have no fear because God is making it happen. Okay, the last phrase to look at is in verse 24. Knowing that from, God, uh, from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. In Luke 10, when Mary and Martha invited uh, Jesus to their home for dinner, Martha kept working, but Jesus said, Mary has made the right choice and it will not be taken away from her. Sometimes we need to just stop working and go home. Some of us really like our work and it's hard to set it aside and stop thinking about it. I love my job. I could talk about it all the time and I could just keep working and working. I'm a lot like this guy. Yeah, I'm a lot like Mr. Incredible. <laughs> Roll it. <laughs> we interrupt for an important bulletin. A deadly high-speed pursuit between police and armed gunmen is underway traveling northbound on San Pablo Avenue. Yeah, I've got time. Okay, look how he's dressed. Oops, there he is. Who remembers where he was going? On his way to his wedding. And he said, yeah, I got time. So how many of us are kind of like that with our work? You know, dinner's on the table getting cold and you're like, yeah, I got time. You know your child's game or performance is about to start. Yeah, I got time. You know you haven't read and reflected on that thing for growth group yet. But you're like, yeah, I got time for work. Why do we do that? Do we just love the achievement? You know that little pop of satisfaction you get when you achieve something? Maybe some people clap for you. Maybe you get the promotion or the bonus. Do you remember a time when something like that happened for you at work? How long did that feeling last? For a while, then it went away, right? You got over it. Just like you get over bad stuff. Whether it's an extreme hurt or an extreme joy, your mind adapts to it. It's the way God made us. And that response is a blessing when tragedy strikes, but when something wonderful happens, your mind has the exact same response. You get over the new car. You get over the new house. You get over the raise, the promotion, the dream job, the accolades. You get over it. Obviously, there are some things we experience that are so extreme they leave a permanent mark on us, but most things in life we eventually discover weren't as significant as we might have thought at the time. I believe that to be true about the rewards from our jobs. Your employer will compensate you on the basis of your job, and that's it. God will give you a much greater reward based on your faithfulness in all aspects of your life. Yes, it's important to honor God with excellence at work. It's just as important to honor him with excellence in every other aspect of your life. That's why sometimes you need to put some boundaries around your work and go home. You know when you get to heaven, you're going to be working, right? You're made in the image of God. He's a worker, and he made you to be like him. You're going to have responsibility given to you by him. I think the parable of the talents in Matthew 25 shows us that. So, don't be this guy. Or this guy. 
be this guy instead. <laughs> We've probably never had anyone in a sermon by encouraging you to be like a porta john <clears throat> But you know what I mean, right? That guy had it figured out, and he was living it every day. So I have some final questions for you. What would it look like if tomorrow you decided, I'm going to do my work with all my heart? What would it look like tomorrow if you made up your mind, I'm going to be an advocate for my boss because God has placed me under him? What would it look like if you decided that starting tomorrow, I'm going to stand strong on Bible-based ethics and morals, zero compromise, even if my coworkers think I've turned into some kind of a nut? What would it look like if tomorrow you decided, this is the day... I'm going to be clear about my connection, the connection between my behavior and my God. What would it look like if tomorrow, after all that, you quit work on time and went home and said, tonight, I'm all here for my family. Work and wait till tomorrow. I think that would be time well spent in Christ alone. If this morning you've decided you'd like to put off your old self and put on a new self made in the image of God by being baptized into Christ, we'd love to help you with that. Or if you're already living in Christ alone, but you could use some prayers, we'd love to help you with that too. Please come forward while we sing this song.